I used to have a, a sign on my door that I copied from a magazine that said, three weeks in the laboratory will save you an afternoon in the library every time. And so sometimes you can just go read. There's an awful lot of people, very smart people who have done amazing work over the years. And a lot of that is documented in the scientific literature and recognizing that not all the good literature has been written in the last 10 years. There's amazing, amazing work that can be much older than that. Just going reading that is, is really essential. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out a lot. Also, we created a free career development guide for MSCs, which you can access using the link in the description. Now let's get on to the episode. Our sponsor today is Johnson Matthey, a global leader in sustainable technology. Johnson Matthey's vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for future generations. Johnson Matthey's scientists use their deep understanding of materials, surface science, chemistry, and chemical engineering to design catalysts, advanced materials, and processes, tackling the world's biggest challenges, such as reaching net zero, enabling cleaner air, improving health, and using our planet's natural resources more efficiently. Johnson Matthey, inspiring science, enhancing life. Hello, everyone. Today's guest is Dr. Susan Trollier McKinstry. She is a professor of material science and engineering at Penn State, where she is the director of the Center for Dielectrics and Piezoelectrics, as well as the Center for Three-Dimensional Ferroelectric Microelectronics. She is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of IEEE, the Materials Research Society, and the American Ceramic Society. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Trollier McKinstry. You're most welcome. Cool. So we can kind of get started with the basics um, and just talk about uh, piezoelectric materials as a whole. So can you just start out by explaining what exactly a piezoelectric material is and what properties make them unique for certain applications? Sure. So piezoelectric materials are materials that convert between electrical and mechanical energies. So if I apply an electrical signal, I apply an electric field, the material will change shape. Or if I apply a mechanical stress to the material, it will generate an electrical response, a polarization or an electric field. That's the operating definition of what a piezoelectric is. And I guess then um, what kind of applications are like, are they most like useful for? So there are piezoelectric materials hidden in lots of different applications. The, we use uh, piezoelectric materials as the timing standards in wristwatches. So quartz single crystals are very widely used for piezoelectric materials. Uh, we also use uh, recognize them for their use in medical ultrasound systems. So piezoelectric materials are the materials that both launch the sound wave and detect the returned sound wave for medical ultrasound or for sonar systems. They're also used for precise positioning applications. So if you think about a high-end microscope that you wanna be able to drive the microscope to a very specific location, we often use piezoelectric actuators to control precise positions and things like atomic force microscopes. And they can be used for many sensing applications as well. So we can sense stresses. They're used for accelerometers, for earthquake detection. So many different flavors of applications. And so what makes piezoelectric uh, materials, what properties make them unique to these applications? So most materials, when you stress them, don't give you a usable electrical signal. So if you were to take a piece of glass and squeeze in a piece of glass, you would have squeezed a piece of glass. <laughs> it, would not, it would not have produced any functional electrical signal that you could measure. So a piezoelectric material is piezoelectric because when I apply a stress, I can generate a polarization. So that's a uh, a dipole moment per unit volume. And if you think back to your 
undergraduate physics classes or your high school physics classes, you'll remember that a dipole is a center of positive charge and a center of negative charge, and there's some separation distance between them. Mm -hmm. And so a piezoelectric material will generate such a dipole moment or change a pre-existing dipole moment when you apply a stress to them. And many materials can't display that property. They're actually symmetry forbidden from displaying that property. So can you give examples of like specific materials that, um, that we know that are piezoelectric have those properties? Sure. Probably the one most people will have heard of is quartz. Mm. So the mineral quartz is the material that's ubiquitous in timing standards. These are materials that have very small piezoelectric coefficients, but they're super stable as a function of temperature. And it would be very depressing if your wristwatch changed uh, its clocking, if you moved from a, you know, outside where it's, you know, 25 degrees outside and, you know, it's like <laughs> college. And then I came into my office and my, you know, my timing standard changed, that would be sad. Um, and so that's, quartz is probably the one that most people will be familiar with. Commercially, uh, other materials that have very large application spaces is aluminum nitride. And mm -hmm. aluminum nitride is used as the frequency filter for most cell phones. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is used to perform the separation of the transmit and the receive portion of the signal so that you don't blow out the receive electronics every time you transmit. Uh, and lead zirconate titanate mm. is the most important family of piezoelectric ceramic materials that are used in buzzers and beepers and sonar systems and medical ultrasound. Yeah, for sure. PZT. Um, I remember hearing that. So I work at Boston Scientific and so um, medical oh. ultrasounds that kind of hits close to home. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I guess going uh, further into that, are there challenges that come with processing piezoelectrics? Um, and I guess maybe can you give us an overview of what that uh, manufacturing looks like, processing techniques look like? So the manufacturing depends hugely on how the material is going to be used. So the quartz materials that are used in timing standards are grown in huge hydrothermal vessels. So these would be multiple stories high and they have little piezoelectric seed crystals suspended in a really high pressure water solution with sand at the bottom. And they establish a temperature gradient so that they can just barely dissolve sand at the bottom and mm -hmm. deposit it on the crystals that are growing above it. And those crystal growth runs may take months to complete, weeks to months, so they're very long. Wow. In contrast, uh, 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 aluminum nitride is a thin film. It's, it's generally used as a thin film and those are almost always grown by a sputter deposition or a chemical vapor deposition process where you're delivering individual atoms or groups of atoms to the a substrate at a time. And so their uh, sputter process, you start with a target of material and you literally slam very energetic ions into that target so that you can create a cascade of material from mm -hmm. that and you collect that cascade of material on a substrate and that's how you grow the film. And bulk ceramic processing is different again, where we would start with raw materials that would be typically powders and we react those powders at elevated temperatures, maybe 900 to 1200 degrees until we get the phase that we're interested in. And then we press them or somehow form them into the shape that we want. Mm -hmm. And then we, we do a process called sintering to densify those materials, to eliminate all the residual porosity. So many different ways to process <laughs> piezoelectric materials, depending on whether we're going to use them as single crystals or ceramics or thin films. Um, you mentioned a little while ago that it's actually that most materials cannot be piezoelectric due to the symmetry issue. Mm -hmm. What makes these uh, gallium nitride and uh, silicon dioxide special that they can overcome this issue and be unique outliers in the material world? 
So the science geeky answer to this question is that piezoelectricity is a third rank tensor property. And that means that it has to obey all of the, it, so symmetry acts on physical properties the same way it acts on the atomic arrangements of atoms. So if you imagine you had um, a polarization that was pointed to the right and you had a some sort of symmetry operation that made a vector equal and opposite that was pointed toward the left, well, now you're done, they add to zero. Mm -hmm. And so what I need to do is to choose a crystal structure where I don't add those vectors to zero. And in quartz, uh, it has to do with the fact that the, the silicon in quartz is not exactly, exactly, exactly at the center of its tetrahedron of oxygens. Mm -hmm. And as I um, stress the material and I change the orientation of those silicate tetrahedra, they, they actually counter rotate under uh, an applied stress, I will make a small change in that existing polarization um, so that I, excuse me, I, that I generate a, a polarization. In other materials, there's a pre-existing polarization. And in that case, when I squeeze it, I often change the magnitude of that polarization. And that's what produces the piezoelectric effect. Is that answering your question well enough? Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> and I guess then, so in one of our previous episodes, we were talking about um, the history of batteries and how it's a very uh, new field relatively, like 30, 40, 50 years. Um, that led me to this question about how old is, I guess, the research for piezoelectrics and how long have we been studying this effect? So piezoelectricity was discovered by the Curie brothers. So we've got more than a century of history oh, for wow. the fact that it exists a very closely related property of pyroelectricity, which is changing a polarization due to an electric or to a, to a temperature change. Tourmaline has been known to be pyroelectric for geologic, you know, okay, you know basically I, I, I guess I should say at least a thousand years at this point. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Most of the best piezoelectrics are from a subset of those materials called ferroelectrics, where I can reorient the spontaneous polarization with an applied electric field. 2020 was the 100th year anniversary of the first presentation of, of ferroelectricity. So we're, we're working on 100, 101 years uh, of that subset of materials that are piezoelectric. And I guess um, we've heard some interesting stories in the past about how things were discovered. Uh, was piezoelectricity actually discovered by accident or were they trying to get to the end goal of having a material that could respond due to mechanical force for an electrical response? I don't know how the Curie brothers found it. And so I, I can't give you a fair answer to that. Okay. But a lot of the work in the field has been driven by applications. And so the ferroelectric effect was discovered as people were trying to generate better materials for sonar applications. So they were looking for materials that would produce bigger responses so they could measure smaller sound levels. And mm -hmm. in that case, they were building Langevin transducers in World War I timeframe. And that helped trigger some of the interest in, in exploiting some of these materials. Well, now we can start getting into some applications. Uh, mm -hmm. You told us a little bit, but maybe going back and circling back to the internal clock within your phone and Apple mm -hmm. products, uh, we're talking about the silicon dioxide. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you kind of explain more about exactly the inner workings? And um, I know you talked a little bit about the formation, but uh, mm -hmm. what, what is the state and what are the challenges? But we're also, uh, why are they the, uh, why are they like chosen completely to do all of the electronics for timing within the phone and not something that could be um, like electronic or anything else? So one of the key things to recognize is that we use piezoelectrics a lot because they give us electrical signal. Mm -hmm. And that is more convenient than, than something that doesn't provide an electrical signal. But the reason quartz is so widely used as a timing standard 
is, is maybe twofold. The first, fundamentally what you're doing is you're taking a little piezoelectric crystal and you give it a little kick with a battery and it starts to oscillate. And you choose the dimensions so that the oscillations correspond to some useful unit of time and you count oscillations. And that's how you do timing um, with that approach. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things that make quartz so nice. The first is that it has an extremely high mechanical quality factor, which means that when you, you give it that initial kick with the battery to, to start it oscillating, it oscillates many, many times. So think about hitting a piece of wood, you know, you knock a piece of wood, you get sound and then it damps very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. A bell, when you strike it, okay, now it's resonating for a while. And so you'll hear that for a while. Um, but quartz will actually, if it's mounted correctly, it might oscillate a million times before the amplitude drops to one over E of its original amplitude. So it's wow. an extraordinary high quality factor, which means you don't have to use up your battery, keeping it oscillating. So that's one useful piece about quartz. A second useful piece about quartz is that you can adjust it so that if you cut it appropriately, there's very, very little temperature dependence to the response. Mm. And most materials would have much stronger temperature dependences. And that would mean that it would clock correctly at one temperature, but then the clocking would change as the temperature changed. And so we actually use the fact that there's a phase transition in quartz to control that temperature dependence and make it largely temperature insensitive over over several hundred degrees C. What do you mean by using that phase transformation? Are you saying you're like you remain in a range outside of it or are you taking that um, into consideration for this temperature so sensitivity? The, the phase transition sequence it, it, from alpha to beta quartz yeah. is, is quite high. It's about 573 degrees C. So no, we aren't actually driving it through the transition, which is <laughs> good. Um, but um, what we do do is use the fact that the material becomes elastically um, softer as we go through the, the phase transition sequence. Um, so it, it, so basically as, as the, the, the octa as the tetrahedra start counter rotating, it produces an elastic response that we can use to offset the frequency dependence you'd get from a thermal expansion coefficient. And if you can offset those two exactly the right way, you can keep everything pretty much frequency, a frequency that will be temperature independent. Oh, cool. That's cool. Um, I don't know if you remember David, but so we had, we had a, a ceramics class and, um, one of those key facts that I still remember is that alpha to beta, uh, quartz transformation temperature. And it was like 573 degrees, just like you mentioned. And so we had a bunch of like little facts that we had to memorize. And that was one that kind of just for some reason stuck through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of our professor's favorites for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess another application that we want to talk about that, um, I'm particularly interested in is medical ultrasounds. So um, Boston Scientific, we have um, ultrasound catheters for imaging. And so, um, you know, there is the use of piezoelectrics in that. And so I was wondering if you could talk through um, why exactly piezoelectrics are used in medical ultrasounds, what makes them optimal for this choice? Well, stop and think for a minute what sound is. Sound is ultimately associated with a vibration. And you can tell that if you just put your hand on your throat and you speak, you will feel the tissues vibrating. And so if we're gonna launch a sound wave, we need to be able to make something vibrate. We need to make it change its shape. And there's lots of ways you can make materials change shape. You could change the temperature, you could apply a magnetic field, you know, all sorts of ways to do it. But one of the ones that's the easiest to integrate with electronics is if you can make a material change its shape with an applied electric field, that's particularly convenient. And that's one of the things that piezoelectrics are good at. And so fundamentally, we use the piezoelectric material to launch the sound wave. And so what you really want to be able to do is to apply a, a voltage spike and then have that generate 
a relatively large amplitude sound wave. And that sound wave travels into the body and it reflects off any discontinuity and acoustic impedance. So any of the things, any of the internal features in the body will reflect that sound wave. And now we have our piezoelectric material in a listening mode. So now I'm listening for the echoes and the echoes are sound waves, which means they're pressure waves. And when I put a pressure on a piezoelectric, I get an electrical signal. And so I use that piezoelectric both to generate the sound wave and as the listener to detect the reflected sound waves. Mm -hmm. And so we optimize materials to try and provide the best sensitivity to, I need to be able to apply, a, you know, I, I don't want to apply many thousands of volts. So I'd like to use a kind of comparatively smaller voltage, generate a usable sound level and then have a good sensitivity to the return sound wave. At a very basic level, it sounds like you're almost explaining like a microphone and speakers. Um, do these uh, follow similar properties or uh, are these electronics differently um, processed and made to achieve relatively similar effects? Well, there's many different ways of, of generating sound. So you can use voice coils. You can use, if you ever walk past a transformer, transformers are humming because you have a material which is magnetostrictive um, in, in it, that's where it's experiencing a, a changing magnetic field. So there's lots of ways to generate sound. This is just a convenient way of generating sound. Mm -hmm. Some of the mechanisms for generating sound don't provide you a good converse effect that they also are good receivers. And so you want to make sure that you can do both of those effectively. Interesting. So is that the main advantage of piezoelectrics is like that ability to, to receive as well in these maybe like sonar based applications? So sonar systems are typically use either big magnets um, and magnetostrictive materials or kind of big piezoelectrics and, and piezoelectric materials to generate the sound waves and, and then respond to them. You can also, in some cases, use an explosion literally as your sound source and then listen to echoes. Um, and piezoelectrics are just very convenient ways of, of doing both of those pieces. Well, that kind of brings us into the next application we talk about as well, um, is that it's also used in uh, relatively similar applications, but fish finders and sonar. Mm -hmm. So how does, when we take the medical ultrasound technology and we translate that to the sonar and fish finder, what things change between the two and how have we kind of um, made it the most efficient as possible for each application? Okay, that's a great question. So the, the lab that I work at has historically worked in both areas. And a lot of the initial materials development was really done for sonar applications. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what the purpose of sonar is, you're usually trying to find objects which are comparatively large and comparatively farther away. Mm -hmm. And so the frequencies that get used for that are often longer wavelength fre frequency, uh, longer wavelengths, lower frequencies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I remember being just an aha moment for me when I was a grad student and started to look at this was to hear someone say, well, recognize that sonar works in the ocean and the human body is largely salt water. And so it's not an enormous surprise that the oh. same generic technologies that work in sonar <laughs> and fish finding, which is the same technology. I'm launching a sound wave and I'm listening for the return echo. The big difference between that and medical ultrasound is the frequency. We're usually looking for smaller things in the body. Mm -hmm. And so we use much higher frequencies. That makes sense, I guess. I, I didn't even think about it like that, but yeah, I guess it's our body is primarily water. So yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess like now we can take it to, I guess, an, a different environment altogether, which is space. Um, and I was just wondering, like, 
Um, so we read online, and you also mentioned this in a previous call, um, the idea of using piezoelectrics for space mirrors um, to act as correctors for space telescopes. And can you walk us through the need for correctors in space telescopes and why piezoelectrics are ideal here? So probably uh, the people listening will remember the Hubble Space Telescope and possibly that when the Hubble was launched, it was launched with a primary mirror that was misground. It literally had the wrong radius of curvature. And that meant that all of the initial images that came back from the Hubble telescope were out of focus. And so they had to build in and then in place correcting optics that had that were a lot like eyeglasses. So, you know, my eyes are <laughs> don't have quite the right radius of curvature. So we use glasses to correct for the wrong radius of curvature and it restores my eyesight. That was similar to what was done for the Hubble uh, sp Space Telescope. And in that particular case, they didn't use piezoelectrics, but they used very, very similar materials that are called electrostrictors, where the response, um, the strain response scales as the square of the electric field rather than linearly with electric field. And that turned out to be really useful for that application because it allowed them to restore to a fiducial zero when they took the electric field off. And um, that is really ultimately the reason that the Hubble telescope has produced all these amazing images subsequently is they were able to essentially correct for the optical errors on the originally launched uh, mirror assembly. Mm -hmm. We've been looking over the last 10 years or so about whether that can be generalized. And one application that I've been working very closely with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory on is the possibility of doing adjusters for X-ray telescopes. So X-ray telescopes are, and the Chandra telescope has told us a huge amount about mm -hmm. some of the underlying physics of the cosmos. And the decadal review that was just released about a month ago, um, the, the, I think it was officially the 2020 decadal, even though they released it in 2021, um, they're planning on starting the research to launch another big X-ray telescope um, in, a, in a very serious way in the middle of this decade. And one of the big challenges is they want to launch a mirror uh, or, or a set of mirrors that will allow them to study much fainter objects. And so that means they, they literally need more photons. And so the way to do that is to have more and more reflecting surfaces. And when they launched the Chandra telescope, the glass uh, reflecting surfaces that, that, that they, they would coat with a metal would be somewhere between a centimeter and over, um, over two centimeters in thickness. And they're big, they're you know, roughly, roughly a meter in diameter and they're tall. Um, that was a lot of glass. And I think I remember the number correctly, it was about 800 kilograms of glass for that mirror assembly. And that okay. meant they, you know, and okay, now I got to get it off the ground. So I can only afford a certain amount of launch weight. And they actually had to pull the fifth reflecting surface out of the telescope because they couldn't get it up. It, it, it blew their launch weight budget. So now if you want to go see fainter objects, I need way more reflecting surfaces, which means they can't be that thick. And as all of you appreciate, anytime I make something thin, it becomes way more flexible. And if I don't get the curvature exactly right, it's going to act like the original misground mirror on the Hubble, and I will end up with bad optics and things will be out of focus. And so we've been working on, can we put piezoelectric materials on the back of the, the, the mirror segments and correct for all the local areas that you get this beautiful, pristine surface that you can correct for things like gravity, um, you know, thin, thin things, they, I mean, they change shape when you release them from gravity. Um, if we have mounting errors, there's all sorts of practical 
things that say, if it's thin enough, there's a real reasonably good chance that I won't be able to get an exactly perfect surface, but we can correct that after the fact. Is there a way to, or like, how are you, how do you know exactly how much to correct by? Is that a fair question? Like, I'm, I'm that is a fair that. question. And <laughs> the, the answer is you go and measure. <laughs> okay. so we have colleagues that uh, measure what's called the influence function. That And so we have this whole array of piezoelectric cells on the back of the, the, the mirror. And we measure for each one, how much deflection do I get for when I actuate each one? And then you change the voltage and you, you basically determine how much deflection do I get for a given amount of voltage. And then you store that. And that then becomes a lookup table that says, okay, now I need this one to move, you know, 30 nanometers over this area, how much voltage do I need? Yeah, that's just a great story of thinking ahead so that we didn't completely blow millions and millions of dollars <laughs> on a telescope that doesn't even work. <laughs> um, add, add some zeros. <laughs> add some, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're right. We're talking about space here. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, revisiting uh, early in application is the idea of the ultrasounds. And now the new idea that you were telling us about before is miniaturized ultrasounds. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what is a miniaturized ultrasound and how piezoelectrics would play a role, but also what's the benefit compared to a just regular ultrasound? So my own research is largely in how do we take these basic piezoelectric materials and convert them from bulk ceramics into something that we could actuate with three volts. So we often use thin films and that allows us to make everything smaller. And there's several reasons why you might want just literally smaller ultrasound systems. Um, it is a tragedy that the average diameter of the American is increasing over time. We're literally getting fatter. Um, and one of the challenges is that fat is acoustically attenuating. And that means that people who are too heavy are literally not scannable for some diagnostics. And so there's a huge interest to be able to use existing body cavities to go do scans. And that gets you underneath the fat layer and restores some of the diagnostic capability. So that's one reason why it might be nice to have a really small ultrasound system. And by small, I'm talking about something that maybe is in a pill that you could swallow, where all of the piezoelectric actuators, all of the electronics, everything, the battery is all encapsulated. And there's lots of reasons that might be interesting to do. Um, one of which is associated with a condition called Barrett's esophagus. And uh, there, uh, the estimates that I've read is somewhere between one and 5% of the US population has this condition where there's enough acid reflux from the stomach that the bottom of the esophagus starts to experience really acidic liquids regularly. And that will ultimately change the character of the tissue there. It's not designed for that level of acid. And that condition is precancerous. And so it would be really nice to be able to detect it. I spoke with a clinician once who described using um, a standard catheter uh, based um, ultrasound tool and her description of feeding that, you know, roughly pinky finger sized cable down past all the glottal tissues was not happy um, to me. And so I'd really, I'd really like to get rid of all the wires. And so that means now I've got to make everything small and self-contained. And so that is an application that is of interest for a medical ultrasound where the entire system is just massively, massively miniaturized. I guess when we talk about ultrasounds, you've told us the history of how Basically, it's taken from sonar and fish finders and back and forth. Uh, as an engineer, and maybe this is more general advice, but how can we take past knowledge of different applications and apply it to something new, such as like miniaturized ultrasounds? And how do we build upon what has already been out there so we don't repeat a lot of work that doesn't need to be done so we can have faster iterations? That is a great question, and I'm certainly not going to give you the definitive answer. Um, <laughs> 
but I can say maybe two things. The first is it's absolutely worth reading. I used to have a, a sign on my door that I copied from a magazine that said, three weeks in the laboratory will save you an afternoon in the library every time. And so sometimes you can just go read. There's an awful lot of people, very smart people who have done amazing work over the years. And a lot of that is documented in the scientific literature and recognizing that not all the good literature has been written in the last 10 years. There's amazing, amazing work that can be much older than that. Just going reading that is, is really essential. And then maybe the second answer that I'd give is very often the fundamentals of, you know, the fundamental physics or chemistry or, you know, electrical engineering, whatever, whatever flavor of discipline that you're interested in, that is often relatively constant for an application. Mm. And so you can sometimes do incredibly useful comparisons. Is this new material even worth trying for this application? If you think, okay, what do I need it to do? What combination of materials properties have to go into that to make it possible? And I often use figures of merit that um, combine those materials properties and I compare different materials that may have been measured different ways. So it's not like it's an easy apples to apples comparison, but you use the figure of merit and you could say, all right, this one's worth it and this one's not. And that's really something I learned from my own thesis advisor, um, who's Professor Robert Noonan. And he's the gentleman who invented the composite transducer geometry that's now used in pretty much every medical ultrasound system. And wow. He told me lots of stories, he, at least three different stories over the years about how he actually did the invention. But the one he told most often was um, he was trained as a mineralogist. And so he knew the chemical formula and usually the crystal structure of all minerals. I mean, he, li he literally knew the names and chemical formula of all known minerals. And that's kind of mind blowing. Um, but he usually knew their crystal structures. And so what he was trying to do um, when he invented the composite transducer was to change the ratio of the electrical signal you get when you squeeze something from the top and when you squeeze it from the sides. And in most materials, sadly, those two almost cancel each other out. So you end up with this really small signal if you press on it from all dimensions. And he looked back and he said, antimony sulfoiodide. Okay, this is a chain structured compound and it has a very, very different ratio of the out of plane and the in plane coefficients because there's not much mechanically coupling those two. And uh, alas, antimony sulfoiodide is a terribly leaky material. It's not hugely useful, but what he thought is, okay, that connectivity, that's what I wanna control. And he, he looked at how do we en engender this artificially and that's how he invented it. And that kind of thoughtful way of looking cross discipline, um, learning from other areas is another really effective way of retaining the information so that you can, you can make maybe unexpected connections or maybe you can shorten product development cycles. So what drew you specifically into this field of piezoelectrics then? Uh, I would say fundamentally, it was my advisor, Professor Robert Noonan. He was, I took a class from him and he had this amazing way of thinking about materials. Um, he knew, knew a huge number of crystal structures. He knew structure property relations really well. And it meant that it almost didn't matter what science talk he was listening to. He knew the crystal structure. He knew the structure property relations and he could extrapolate incredibly from that. And so I used to watch him ask questions. Like, I know he doesn't know anything about this field. I know what he's published. And he would still ask these amazing questions. And that was really revelatory to me that you could be so deep in one area and broad enough you know, so that you had enough connections to the rest of the field that you could think beyond your own level of expertise. So that was incredibly appealing to me.
And secondly, he was also the best teacher in the department and arguably one of the best teachers in in the entire field in the discipline. And I wanted to learn to teach like that. And so that was kind of a second draw. And thirdly, piezoelectrics are just cool. <laughs> I, I can apply an electric field and I can make a material change its shape. What? That is too neat. Um, and so I think it was some combination of those three things that, that drew me to the field. Absolutely. I remember even on like my first day at work, kind of learning about just piezoelectrics in general. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by it too. And especially in it's like medical ultrasound applications. So that's really cool that you had a great advisor that kind of inspired you to join this field and then also complement it with just a really interesting uh, field as well. Um, and so we can kind of walk through one more application really quickly, and that is um, computing. And so we just wanted to get kind of hear about how energy can be saved through utilizing piezoelectrics. I think many people appreciate that uh, it's becoming more and more challenging to scale transistors down or approaching potentially the end of Moore's law. One of the things that I hadn't appreciated as much was that when we made decisions to have memory on one chip and processors on a second chip, we fundamentally made a decision that the energy cost and the time cost associated with getting information back and forth was, was one we were, it was worth paying. But that is becoming progressively a larger fraction of the energy associated with computing. And there, for some applications, the estimate is that up to 80% of the energy cost is associated with getting information back and forth between memory and processor and between processor units. And so one of the research areas we're working on is to take materials which are ferroelectric and all ferroelectrics are inherently piezoelectric and use those to create memory that we can stack directly on the processor. So we can get rid of some of this energy cost and some of the time cost associated with getting information back and forth between the memory and the processor. And so in that case, we're not really utilizing the fact that the material is piezoelectric. We're using the fact that I have a polarization. In that case, it's spontaneous and I can reorient the polarization direction with an electric field. And so I could say, use the polarization up as a one and polarization down as a zero, and I can use that as a memory. And so we're working very hard now to understand what are the implications of this? Can we process the materials? Can, you know, is this integration at the required length scale gonna be possible? Many, many unanswered, unanswered questions there, but we're, we're giving it a whirl. Oh well, yeah. Uh, th that's really cool. And just again, just an example of how we can use the same technology, which is relatively simple once you fully understand it, and can change so many different process settings or other applications to make all these very unique applications that are all similar in what they're doing, but all so different because it's like across the board, it's under the sea and in space. Um, so I thank you so much for talking to us today. I feel like I really uncover piezoelectrics and the deep understanding of how to leverage knowledge from past applications into future products that is going to be incredibly important as I move forward as an engineer. I guess we just want to ask you one more question and you already gave such great advice, but what advice would you give to any engineer who wants to be in your place, wants to be an effective communicator, wants to leverage from the past and specifically in this piezoelectric research? Read as broadly as you can. Talk to the people in the field. Um, don't try and reinvent everything yourself. Yeah, <laughs> keep it short and simple. But yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> I feel like reading and kind of like talking to people is a cheat code to to get you further at a at a more efficient pace. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I, I echo everything David said, um, and we really appreciate it. And I think our audience will enjoy this one too. All right, thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing, hitting the like button down below, and commenting what topics and guests you'd like to see next. To download our free career development guide for MSCs, check out the link in the description. We'll see you soon, and in the meantime, go change the world. <laughs>